You're listening to the Face Fatty Podcast, episode 106. Today we're talking about medical fat phobia. Perfect. I'm Victoria Wellsby, TEDx speaker, best selling author, and fat activist. I have transformed my life from hating my body with desperately low self-esteem to being a courageous and confident, fierce fatty who loves every inch of this jelly. Society teaches us living in a fat body is bad, but what if we spent less time, money and energy on the pursuit of thinness and instead focused on the things that actually matter, like if pineapple on pizza should be outlawed or if the mullet was the greatest haircut of the 20th century. So how do you stop negative beliefs about your fat body controlling your life? It's the Fierce Fatty Podcast. Let's begin. Hello and welcome to this episode. How are you? How are you doing? Massive, massive trigger warning on this episode. I'm going to be listing um, medical fat phobia stuff and it's really fucking heavy. Really heavy. So uh, if you're not up for that, then uh, skip to the next episode. But wait, 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 wait. You don't have to yet. I'm going to tell you how my date went. I'm going to tell you how my date went, okay? But um, after that... After that, actually, I'm going to talk, talk about the levels of fat phobia. But then after that, that I'll I'll tell you again. But okay, so uh, I'll tell you again when it's time to when we when we when it's time to talk about the medical fat phobia. I'll, t- I'll tell you what's up. Okay, 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 okay. So last week I was about to go on a date, right? My first date in Vancouver since I've been back, and my first date in two years since the COVID started. So I spoke to. So I had a, a phone date, right? Zoom, Zoom didn't work, and so we just spoke over the phone. My internet wasn't working. We ended up speaking for a couple of hours, and then uh, that was Wednesday. And then on Friday, we were we were talking again, and um, in between then, in between then, we decided we were going to go in an in-person date um, on the Saturday. So on Friday. He called me again and we had an hour conversation and then Saturday uh, we went to a restaurant and had dinner and so now it is Wednesday again so happened this weekend and um, yeah it wasn't great <laughs> oh. So the first two hour conversation was was good, right? It was good. It was he was like I don't know, chill. And um, looking back, I can see a couple of red flags that I took as him being playful. So for example, he said he likes to go hiking, and I I like going um I like going hiking. And when I say hiking, I mean walking through you know, the forest or going to a mountain and walking through a relatively flat route, nothing too wild, nothing, no, like, kind of scrambling or, uh, you know, rock climbing shit like that. Like, I wouldn't do that in theory, but I do like it, you know, that's, I just enjoy, I just enjoy being out in nature. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? But there's one thing in Vancouver that I would never do because it just sounds fucking horrible. It's something called the grouse grind. Just by that name, grind, you know that it's awful. Uh, some people might some people love it right it's a mountain in Vancouver and people and it's like a stairmaster for three hours to the top stairs 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 and a lot of people love it and to me that just doesn't sound fun yeah you're in nature but you know I like a bit a little bit up a little bit down a little bit straight a lot more straight you know that type of thing versus this is the type of thing that people will do on a, on a Sunday and try and beat their best time and all that type of stuff which is fine, whatever, if people are doing it. But anyway, he was like, oh, I, I just bought a season's pass to do that because I think you get, like, the gondola down. And he's like, oh, yeah, you can do that with me. And I was like, eh, no, I don't think so. Not my cup of tea. And he kept going on about it, kind of like, come on, come on, sort of thing. And I thought he was being playful. No, maybe he was, but maybe not. But anyway. And then also he, on uh, the second conversation, I said, oh, I need to go because it's Dougal's bedtime. And he is 
Dougal wants to go out. And Dougal is very, very on schedule. Like, he's like, he'll start giving me, um, he'll start giving me shit if I'm not following his schedule. <laughs> his schedule. So he decides he likes going out for a, a, his nighttime walk at like 8.30. Um, you know, if it's, a, if it's a weekend, I might be able to convince him to go in a little bit later. And so I had convinced Dougal and it was like 9.30, 10 o'clock. And so our, Dougal was like, for fuck's sake, what he does is he, he just stares and then pitter patters his feet. And then if he gets really frustrated, he'll go, he'll do a tiny little cry. And then if he's like, actually like, I don't know, got a turtle head or something, he'll do a, a little bark. But he's, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the, the levels of him. He, so Dougal was at the uh, the staring, the pity, pitter pat, he might have done a little. <laughs> anyway, so I said to this, uh, I said to the guy, I said, listen, I need to go, uh, Dougal needs to go out. And he was like, oh, what are you gonna, um, is your dog more important than me? And I took that as him joking. Now I'm like, mm-hmm, that was a bit controlling. And then on the date, um, on the date, on the date, on the date, uh, an hour before the date, he said he was going to be late. And so I said, let's just, you know, he says he wasn't sure how long. And so I said, let's just make it another hour. So we, the, the date was then an hour hour. And I thought, you know what, well, it's not great, but, um, you know, life happens, whatever. Uh, and then when I got there, he said, oh, he's three minutes away. I thought, okay, better be three minutes because I ain't, I ain't waiting around if someone's late. Um, he ended up being 15 minutes late, which was right on the cusp of my my secret rule of if they're any more than that late, then that's it, I'm walking. So he, he arrived just in time before I, before I walked off. Um, and... Oh man, he, <laughs> oh, God. he rated my conversation skills as being a three out of 10. Um, <laughs> listen now, I know we're not having a conversation, but I am a great fucking conversationalist. Like I am really curious. And so if someone's not that much of a talker, that's okay because I can hold the conversation, but I love ask, asking people questions about themselves and I'm genuinely, genuinely curious and I'm, and I'm playful and, you know, I'm, I'm, and I'm, um, uh, empathetic and all that type of stuff. So, I mean, I don't want to toot my own horn, but my conversation skills are not a three out of 10. But anyway, he just, just decided to rate, rate my conversation skills. Um, he not once referred to me as they, um, he was talking about me in like, he was saying, oh, I'm going to be late and she's going to be mad. And cause I said, I asked him why he was late and, and I'm going to ruin the day and she's going to hate me. And, uh, you know, he, so he said, he said, she, he referred to me, she probably 10 times. Um, and I kept correcting him. And then we, we were talking about non-binary stuff. And, and I was like, do you think that you might be able to say, call me they before the end of the night? And he was basically like, no, <laughs> don't count on it. He didn't go, Pff. But, you know, he was like, nah, it's too difficult. And he was talking about how he has a non-binary friend and he has, is refusing to talk to that non-binary friend because he, for whatever reason. And so he was like, I, you know, I want to come on this date so I, I could face face up to non-binary-ness. Um, and he was, so my dad, my dad um, died a few years ago. But my dad, uh, the big theme of what was difficult about my dad is that he would go on monologues. And when we were kids, uh, when, when before, before my mum and dad got divorced, at the, um, at the dinner table, we would have to sit. And at the end of the dinner, we'd have to sit for as long as he was doing a mon monologue. And he wouldn't be engaging us. He wouldn't be engaging anyone. Everyone would be sat in silence. And maybe my mum might say a word here and there or whatever. But he'd just be going on long monologues. And then we, as, as kids, would be saying, you know, like, oh, daddy, can we leave the table? And he'd say, no, you have to stay. And so we'd have to stay and listen to his, like, boring monologues. And and as as we grew, grew older, when we are having conversations with him, basically that's what it was. It was, he wouldn't ever say, like, hey, how are you? Or whatever. He would just, you know, monologue on. And so... Uh, and that kind of, you're not allowed to interrupt. You're not allowed to, yeah. He'd always be like, don't interrupt, don't interrupt. Uh, <laughs> and so this is a kind of triggering thing for me. And, and sat at that table, I just felt like, 
child Victoria, especially when he was like kind of telling me off about my conversational skills and how I could do better. Um, um, and uh, I, I just kept looking away thinking, I need to leave. I need to walk out. But being too scared, you know, going back to that child, Victoria, I've sat at the table with my dad and him monologuing and, and me saying, oh, daddy, can I go to this? No, Sit, you know, stop interrupting. Um, and then and I just kept looking, but like, oh, I'm just going to, maybe I'm going to say, oh, uh, uh, I need to go to the toilet and then leave or something. Um, yeah, and it was all just, it was all just a bit shit and boring. Um he did other things too. I can't remember anyway, but, uh, so left next day, he sends me a text. Um, that night he sends me a text saying, you know, thanks for coming out. And I said, you know, thank you. Thank you for the dinner. And then the next day he sent me a text and I didn't respond. I was planning to respond on Monday saying, Hey, we're not a good fit. And so then he sent me another text and within maybe 10 minutes of that text, he called me and I was like, oh, fuck, Jesus, like, chill, dude. <laughs> like, we've been on one day, relax. And then I'd sent out a text saying, oh, hey, I don't think we're a good fit. You know, thanks again for dinner. I don't think we're a good fit. fit. Good luck with your adventures, your dating adventures or whatever. And then he, then he sent me four messages. And they were just so fucking creepy. Like, so he's like, oh, I, I watched your TED Talk. I hadn't shared anything with him about what my business was called, what my last name was, anything. And I was thinking, how the hell would he have known who I was? It's not like I have a unique first name. Um, and so I realized out of all the images I share on my social media account, one is one that I've also shared on my Instagram. The rest are private. Uh, you know, I've not shared them on the, on, on the internet before. And so he must have done like a reverse image search to find me which is what is like creeping me out. Uh, Cause I don't, I can't think of any other way he would have known who I, who I was. And I didn't even tell him that I do like fat phobia stuff. Um, I just kind of briefly mentioned about confidence or whatever. So there's no way he could have been like Victoria fat activist and found me. I wonder if that would even bring me up. Let's see, I'm gonna Google it. Okay, well it comes up, maybe cause I'm Googling myself, you know, probably it knows who I am, right? I got, I gave my home book a thumbs up. Ah. <laughs> uh, so maybe, maybe he found it that way, but either way, uh, he's like, oh, um, uh, oh, I watch your TED talk and I'm going to be listening to your podcast from now on. Just really kind of just making me feel really uncomfortable. And he, you know, then he sent, uh, another message and I'm just like go away leave me alone I'm not I wasn't responding to him and I'd even blocked his number I blocked his number and the only reason I know that he's sending me these messages is because I blocked his number on my iPhone and then when at night time I'd go to my iPad to, re to read my book read my book on my iPad uh, a book not my book um, and for some reason his blocked messages would come up on my iPad oh my god so Anyway, I hope he's not listening. If you're listening, please just leave me alone. I'm not I'm not into this, you 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 following me and all this type of stuff. Um, but hopefully it's not. I was thinking, oh, you know what? Um, well, I can imagine him coming to my house or something. That's the kind of vibes. And and the reason why I was like, kind of like, oh, red flags is in the messages he sent, it was it felt like, oh, I've been in an abusive relationship, right? I've made, made podcast episodes about it. And so I feel like I'm very sensitive to when people are showing kind of red flags for being abusive. Um, and um, and so it's kind of like a lot of love bombing, kind of a lot of like when I said, oh, no, I'm not interested, a lot of, um, oh, but you're so great. And I watch your TED talk and la, 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 you know, I'm going to follow you and you're doing such great work and all this type of stuff. And he didn't say anything like that before, before he was kind of um, negging me, you know, kind of being a little bit mm, on the day, on the day, being a little bit mean. Um, yeah. So, 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 uh, I reckon if that's how he behaved after one day, can you imagine two or three? Oh, anyway. So that was fun. That was an experience. It wasn't fun. At the end of the day, I got in my car and I was like, 
oh, thank God I can go home to Dougal. And when I got home to Dougal, I was like, oh, Dougal, you're my, you're my main man. You're my number one. I love you and had cuddles. And so that was nice. So, yeah. Uh, but hey, listen, don't let this put you off dating, okay? Uh, I, I, and it's so sad. Like my, two, two of my friends, I text them both and I was like, oh, hey, the date wasn't great, but I'm still alive. Huh? And then afterwards it was kind of like, oh, <laughs> why is it that women and uh, non-binary people or uh, gender non-conforming, anyone with a marginalized gender identity after a date has to be like, I, were, I wasn't murdered. Like legit, I bet you, you have done this. If you are any of those types of people, you have done that to a friend after a date, if you've been dating. And I always send a picture of the guy to my friends. The sole reason I send a picture of the guy before the date is if he murders me, they know they have a picture. Might not be his picture, you know, it might be a fake picture, but they have a picture. But how fucked is that? We live in a society where it is just standard course. Like no friend has ever said to me, oh, but why are you sending me their picture? It's, they know why I'm sending the picture. It's because if I get murdered, this is who did it. I've done that, like, for years I've done that. And I bet you I'm not the only one. Uh, and I shared the, the, uh, the kind of, the, I shared on, on Instagram and people were saying, yeah, like, fuck. Why it is fucked up that we have to say, at least I didn't get murdered. So was the date that bad? <laughs> I'm not dead. You know, and the standard for cis men is like, oh, they didn't fuck me. Oh, I wasted money on a dinner for them and they didn't suck my dick, you know. It's um, it's not good, is it? It's not good. So, um, anyway, so I had paid for OkCupid Premium. I think I told you that last week. I paid for OkCupid Premium. Um, and it, so far, I don't know who's, if, is it worth it? I had a date. I had a few, I had a few conversations, much more than I've had um, without paying for it. So, you know what? I've got it for six months. See what, see where it goes. See where it goes. Maybe next week I'll have another date. It'd be better. And that's the thing. Doing like, uh, doing the phone screening. I asked one guy if he wanted to chat on the phone. He's like, no, I'd rather see you in person. And I'm thinking, yeah, no shit, Sherlock. Seeing people in person is better. But um, sometimes you have to think about the safety of. Um, if you're a cis man, the safety of your partners. If you're a cis het man, you have to think about their, how comfortable they are. And um, if someone says, hey, do you want to chat on the phone first to make sure that your picture matches your face, that you are not a complete raging asshole, then I think you're going to have to do it, you know? Instead of being like, I prefer in person. Well, yeah, <laughs> obviously, you know, especially if you're out there being like, Oh, you know, I want to be dipping my balls in someone's mouth. You can't be doing that on Zoom. Of course you prefer in person. But, you know, you have to build up that trust. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you know, before I wasn't doing this, I wasn't doing the phone calls. I would just go straight to the date. So, I don't know. Maybe something's changed in me over COVID where I'm just like, I can't be putting up with this shit with, <laughs> with men. Uh, I don't want to waste. I don't want to waste my time putting on clothes to go out, to go on a date, and the guy turns out to be a bozo, right? And, but here's the thing, this example of me going, having two, so I had spoke to this guy for three hours before the date, and it wasn't until the date that he showed who he was, right? So, you know, which again kind of makes me think, you know, abusery type things, because I feel like sometimes people who are abusive are, are kind and nice to start with, and then they, they have to let, let, let things slip because I can't keep up with it because it's tiring, it's tiring having to be nice when that's not really your, your MO. Uh, anyway, let's have a deep breath. Let's not think about how difficult it is to be a human being. One day you're gonna be listening to the podcast and I'm gonna be like, you know what? Listen up here, I'm in love with someone. And you're gonna be like, yes, Victoria, that's amazing. Not today, but you know, maybe one day. Uh, and it makes me as well think it, the the love that I get from friendships is so nice and wonderful and great and um, I can totally see why a lot of people were just like no I can't be bothered with romantic relationships you know for various different reasons I get it I get it I get it okay so moving on to I want to talk to you about levels of fat phobia I've never spoken about this and I um, have made a, a Instagram post about it and I thought I would talk to you talk to you about it in case you don't know about this concept. 
Um, I was reading a blog post that Virgie Tovar had done four years ago now for Ravishly. Ravishly? Ravishly. Ravishly. Ravishly? Is it? <laughs> Hang on. Levels of fat phobia. I think it is. Yeah, Ravishly. It's kind of a funny, it's kind of a funny thing. Um, and so this word, I, uh, Virgie didn't mention it in, in, um, in this post for, for Ravish, Ravishly. This concept comes from um, anti-racist work, um, social justice work, and, you know, different levels of oppression. And so it was, it's already, it's already, it's already been something that uh, people are talking about. Uh, but I think Virgie, uh, well, maybe, I don't know if Virgie uh, kind of put the two and two together for fat phobia. It was four years ago. So I would hazard to guess uh, someone did it before her, but I just want to say where I kind of got that concept from. Um, and so the the four, the three levels, the three levels, well, you know, let's talk about four. Uh, let's talk about five. <laughs> let's fuck it, let's make that up, let's go. But uh, what Virgie talked about is three levels being, the first level is intra-personal, intra-personal. And so intra-personal, is uh, fat phobia where you, the beliefs you hold about your fatness and how you perceive yourself uh, due to those beliefs. So that the intrapersonal is the beliefs you hold about your fatness, like the negative you, beliefs you hold about your fatness and um, how you perceive yourself due, due to those beliefs, how you treat yourself due to those beliefs, the, the thoughts are, that are running around your head. So some examples are uh, of intrapersonal fat phobia is negative self-talk, agreeing with fat phobic beliefs, and minimizing yourself. So minimizing yourself could be physically minimizing yourself or um, with your actions and with your, with your words, minimizing yourself because you believe that you're a bad fat person. So as well, I have added in here internalized because this could, you know, intrapersonal fat phobia is internalized fat phobia. It's internalizing those fat phobia beliefs uh, that society have about your fat body. Now I've seen, I've seen people referring to internalized fat phobia as something that straight sized people can experience. And, and I have kind of two different thoughts on this of, no, you can't internalize oppression if that oppression isn't about you. And so you're not experiencing internalized fat phobia, you're just fat phobic, you know? The internalize is when you're putting it on yourself. But here's the other thought that I have as well, which is the idea that even if you're not fat, you're internalizing those beliefs and you're holding a mirror up to yourself and seeing someone who is too big. A lot of thin people, you know, think that they're, they're not thin, right? And a lot of, you know, straight-sized people are like, oh, I'm, I'm fat, I'm too big. But then really, they're not fat. And so is that internalized fat phobia? Um, just two different thoughts about it. I'm still kind of struggling with that idea of... Um, because you wouldn't think, like, with any other uh, social justice issues, you wouldn't think... Uh, I'm struggling with internalized ableism. If you haven't have an able body, you just say I'm ableist. You wouldn't say I'm struggling with internalized transphobia if you're a trans person, would you? Maybe you would. Maybe I would. I don't know. So okay, so that's intrapersonal, and I've added onto there or internalized. Next, we've got interpersonal. E N T E, not E N T. I N T E R. Personal. So the first one is E. I, <laughs> letters are hard, I-N-T-R-A, personal. The next is interpersonal. And so interpersonal is the beliefs other people have um, about you, your fatness. When I say you, I mean you as a fat person. If you're a straight-sized person, then it's fat people. Uh, and how they treat you or fat people due to those beliefs. And so that's that's personal individual relationships and so what that could look like is being shamed by loved ones 
being rejected as a romantic partner or being told to lose weight. And so this, uh, this image that I've created, if you think about a small circle, that's the smallest, it's, it's yellow. The next circle is, uh, is just behind that. It's like a growing orb type of thing. And so the next circle is, is, is bigger, an orange circle. And then the biggest circle is institutional. Institutional fat phobia is the belief society holds about your fatness and how it treats you due to those beliefs. And so some examples of institutional, isn't that such a nice word? Tutional, tutional. Actually, maybe that's a British way of saying it. Let me think how, how a North American would say institutional. Institutional? Yeah, you'd say two. You wouldn't say stu, 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 you'd say two if you're a North American. Institutional, two. There's an S-T-I there. An S-T-I-T, institute. Now I can't even say it. Institutional, institution. Anyway, <laughs> examples of institutional uh, fat phobia is medical fat phobia, job discrimination, access to resources, access, you know, um, access, access, you know, things like structural, um, going into a restaurant, being able to sit, going onto an airplane, being able to fly, uh, being able to access all the different things that straight sized people access, like clothing, like medical care, all of that. So any type of access. Um, and a sense of community belonging. So a sense of the, the community as a whole, is is not happy that you're there and doesn't support you as a human yeah so something that nick mcdermid i'm going to link to nick's uh instagram page nick mcdermid shared a couple of weeks ago and i was like ooh. and this is a new concept to me but uh, apparently nick has said that um the four eyes of oppression um and so the fourth eye is the idea um, so ideological. So ideological is, and so the way that I've done it on this post is you've got those three circles, one getting bigger, and then you have a, a kind of a bracket encompassing it all. And the bracket encompassing it all is ideological. Ideological. And so ideological fat phobia is the belief that fat people are ethically or morally inferior and don't deserve dignity and respect, a social, cultural and political belief. And so an ideological, uh, ideological fat phobia could look like everyone knows it's a case of eating less, exercising more. If they can't do that, then they are lazy and unhealthy. Why do I have to pay for the choices of fat people? So Nick says... Um, this concept has been around for a while now in terms of the four eyes of oppression. The idea is that the ideological beliefs make their way into institutions in society, which then shows up in our inst interpersonal interactions with others, and thus we internalize fat phobia. So you can see how fat phobia isn't just, oh, I don't like my fat body. It isn't just, I can't find clothes. It's, it's, it's woven into the fabric of our society at every single level. And it's like this group think in our society that fatness is bad. And so um, things are set up to punish fat people and fat people internalize those messages. Um, yeah, so I wanted to, to share that because I wanted to kind of dig in deeper about fat phobia in public health. A lot of times when people think about uh, fat phobia in public health, they think about kind of, they don't know about it, right? Because if you are a smaller bodied fat person, or if you haven't experienced certain types of medical conditions or illnesses or whatever, you haven't had that experience of coming up against something. And um, and so I wanted to make a list of all the different ways that we have fat phobia in in healthcare. The one one the one main one that people talk about, which is really important because it affects almost every fat person on the planet, is um, being told to lose weight. Right. So, um, but it's so much more than that. It's so much more than that. So at this point, if you don't want to hear all the different ways that medical fat phobia, see you later on the next episode, I'll har, because I'm going to get into it and it's fucking... So I've um, I've come up with 
30 ways, isn't it? I didn't realize it was 30. I just started rattling off some and then I, I did this over a few days and I was like, oh shit. And the reason why I, why I was inspired to do this is because I watched an incredible presentation um, called Fat Phobia in Public Health and Dietetics. What Dietitians Need to Know by Mikey Mercedes and Monica Crete. So good. Go to Mikey Mercedes Instagram page and you might be able to find a link to it. I don't want to share the link directly because there is the option to donate. So I want you to be able to donate if you do want to watch that presentation. It's two, point, two hours, two hours, 10 minutes, 15 minutes of just fucking juiciness. And so I watched that. I literally watched that over um, like a week. It took me a week to watch it because I was, um, I just kept wanting to like write notes, like increase my list of, of medical fat phobia and, and whatnot. And um, you know, just write down quotes from, from Mikey and from Monica because they were saying so many juicy things. Um, yeah, so it took me so long to watch it because then I was going back and listening and stuff. Actually, there was, a, there was an episode, I don't know, if you do you watch, there's a show, um, what is it, Mortician, Mortician. It's a YouTube show. Um, let's see. Caitlin Doherty? Caitlin Doherty. She's not Irish, but what is, Ask a Mortician, that's what it's called. Anyway, Caitlin Doherty from, uh, oh, maybe it's not Doherty, it's not Doherty, it's Dirty, 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 dirty. Oh, why can't I say that in a British way? Do, doty. Anyway, whatever. Ask a mortician. <laughs> Sorry if Caitlin's listening. She wouldn't be listening. She's like a super famous person. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm gonna find this talk, this um, this one piece that she did. So she she's a mortician, right? Um, and she spoke about. She speaks about, you know, people dying and viruses and, you know, things like that, you know, weird things. And um, there's one actually dying, dying fat. So that's really good. I'll link to that. Um, but anyway, she did a, she did a, uh, I'll link to it. I can't remember the name of it right now. I'm looking on, on a YouTube channel. Um, she, uh, she also talks about like creepy things about uh, basically the racism in public health. And she went to these different places where, um, oh, like 1800s in San Francisco, uh, they would have, um, when, when immigrants were coming in to San Francisco, uh, and diseases started coming because of the terrible conditions that they, uh, they, you know, the, 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 you know, Chinatown and, and what that looked like and how many people were living in a house and how they didn't have sanitation and la 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 and diseases um, started to spread. And white people were like, oh, it's fine, it's fine because don't worry, we can't get diseases because we're not like, we're immune. White people are immune from diseases. So they didn't really care. They just kind of cordoned off Chinatown and was just like, well, I'll just let them all die, whatever. Um, and then uh, surprise, surprise, uh, white people started getting sick because uh, it turns out that white people can get sick, weird. And it's not just, uh, you know, Chinese people uh, or anyone else who isn't white uh, that is, was getting sick. And then they took it seriously and then they, they started doing things. Anyway, so that was kind of uh, some, Mikey talked a little bit about that. She wasn't mentioning this video, but it's, it's in a book. And I think Caitlin uh, took a, t spoke about that book too. Um, and oh, so good, so good. I'm talking about the idea about how public health, and so anyway, the reason why I told that story um, is the idea that public health is not based in, well, it's based in, in eugenics. It's based in um, really problematic ideas of helping white people, but, you know, getting rid of the problematic anyone else something that Mikey and uh, Monica were talking about in this presentation is that how public health promotes the eugenics of fat people. And now you might say, that seems a bit extreme, eugenics. Let me just tell you the definition of eugenics. Let's see what Google tells me. Eugenics a set, is a set of beliefs and practices that aim to improve the gene, genetic quality of a human population. 
historically by excluding people and groups judged to be inferior and promoting those judged to be to be superior. So that's what eugenics is. Um, so bear that in mind if that's kind of like a bit shocking, that concept that public health promotes the eugenics of fat people. Um, let me list out ways that medical fat phobia exists in the world. Okay, so CT and MRI machines are made for fat, for, are made for small bodies. Healthcare providers are trained to perpetuate weight stigma with their education. Blood pressure cuffs are for straight sized arms. So when a blood pressure cuff is, uh, um, if they don't have a range of different sizes of blood pressure cuffs, um, it will give a false high reading. Um, and so you can see how that is, is problematic. Um, or they'll be so small that they won't be able to even take someone's blood pressure. Four, the prescription of eat less and exercise more without asking what we eat or how we exercise. Isn't that, my, doctor's just said, my doctor said that to me recently. And I was like, bitch, how the fuck do you know what I eat? And you know, you, how I move my body. She was assuming because I'm fat. Healthcare providers are disgusted by fat bodies, don't want to touch fat people or provide care. Their level of fat phobia exceeds the general population. How can you provide evidence-based care when you hold massive amounts of bias against your patient? That was five. Six, praising of eating disorders if they result in weight loss or the hopes of weight loss. The amount of times you hear the stories of, of people saying, I was um, deep in an eating disorder and my doctor was so thrilled with my weight loss. If a straight-sized person came in, with you know the same symptoms and said oh, I'm eating nothing and I'm moving this or I'm eating this and la 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 the doctor would be like listen up that's not so good for you but whether it's a fat person then it's like fuck yeah keep carrying on with that seven relentlessly monitoring weight of patients with weigh-ins every appointment but no monitoring of weight stigma so um, that that monitoring of weight it is we don't we don't monitor other things in the same way of you know weight stigma is what causes what one of the things that causes poor health outcomes in fat people but no one is measuring that they're just measuring the weight of fat people um you know and for a lot of people it's just a standard thing you go into the doctors and they want to weigh you luckily my doctor doesn't do that she only wants to do that on the, the yearly exam. But um, even then, the yearly exam, what's it got to do with anything? It's got nothing to do with anything. Eight, examine surgical tables with weight limits. Imagine that. Imagine, you know, exam table. You, you go into the doctor's office. First, you can't sit down because they don't have any chairs with without arms. Then you get into the um, into the into the office and you can't sit on the exam table or there's no chair in there without arms and you're just left there standing. It's so fucking fat phobic and ableist. And often people are turned away because they have a um, a, a table to perform surgery, which is is really really small. Literally, the fat body can't get on it. And have you noticed? You know, if you're going for a massage, anyone who's gone for a massage who has a fat body will know that, that you're having to tuck your arms under your body because your arms don't fit on the table. And that, that's just ridiculous. It's, yeah, it's ridiculous. So anyway, you know, you're not going to be able to get the massage, but even more importantly, not be able to get surgery. Nine, being given inaccurate dosages of drugs and drugs, drugs that don't work effectively on fat people. So for example, so an FYI, drugs are very often not tested on fat bodies. They're tested on straight sized people who they claim, they, they're, straight, they're tested on quote unquote healthy people and to be quote unquote healthy, they only wanna pick straight sized bodies. And so that's what happens is drugs are tested, tested on straight sized people. How do they work in fat people? Uh, who knows? Example, really good example, is the morning after pill or, or plan B. 
That only works effectively in people under 160 something pounds, which is really small, which is straight sized, right? For it to work effectively, you need to be under 160 pounds. So that's tiny. Yeah. Next, 10. Being diagnosed, no, 10. Health being diagnosed by our body size and not with actual evidence based diagnostic tools that thin people have access to. So, you know, a, a straight sized person goes in and says, oh, you know, I've, uh, I, I don't feel well. Um, versus a, a straight sized person, a straight sized person is more likely to have tests run um, for the doctor to investigate what the ill, what the issue is. Whereas a fat person is uh, being diagnosed by the doctor's perception of their health with no diagnostic tools, just um, by looking at their body. 11, having to pay higher insurance premiums or being denied any coverage at all. We often see this literally being denied coverage at all through your work policy. Um, and luckily in the UK, you know, people aren't denied access to the, the NHS as a whole. Now they are denied access to lots of different things within the NHS, but not being able to have insurance. So luckily the NHS is not charging fat people to access basic services. In the uh, in other countries that have in health insurance, then you know a lot of fat people can't even get insurance, even if they're willing to pay. And if they are willing to pay, you bet you bet you and if they are willing to pay, you bet they are paying more. So 12, vaccines being administered with needles that are too short. Uh, as I mentioned in an episode, a uh, couple of episodes ago about COVID vaccines, um, some vaccines need to go into the muscle, some need to go into the fat. Uh, example for COVID needs to go into the muscle. Um, someone who is over about around 200 pounds, which again is not fat really, um, needs to have a longer needle. Um, that is the uh, recommendations for most healthcare authorities around the world, is that someone who is over 200 pounds, a, a cis woman, um, needs a longer needle. And um, how many are given a longer needle? Probably not a lot. 13, fat people being denied assistance with IVF so they cannot become pregnant. The cut-offs for fat people getting IVF are so low. Imagine that. If you want to have a child, you want to become pregnant, and you are being told that you cannot because you are too fat. And the stats around it are just absolutely heartbreaking because, you know, they say, oh, the risk of this doubles. And what was it? Like, uh, go back to the, listen to the episode with Nicola Salmon, who uh, talks about fat fertility. The risk of um, diabetes, what do they call it um, if you get diabetes in pregnancy? Gestational diabetes doubles. It doubles from something like 0.4 to 0.8. And so they're like, oh, well, the risks are doubled. And it's like, um... <laughs> Yeah, but let's look at the information. Um, yeah, and, and why is that? Why? Is it because they have more fat on their body or is it because they're experiencing weight stigma, poor health care, and yo-yo dieting? Hmm, you know. 15, when a patient has a higher weight, uh, doctors report liking their jobs less and having less patients, patients with a CE, patients as in, I'm losing my patience and desire to help the patient, as in human. So when a patient has higher weight, doctors reported liking their jobs less and having less patience. 16, doctors see doctors seeing fat patients as inherently high risk and therefore don't want to perform surgery in case their insurance premiums go up in times of adverse outcomes. Pressure is put on doctors by their uh, their seniors to not take high risk surgeries or surgeries that they deem to be high risk. They see a fat person, they say higher risk, not going to do it. And so, literally, fat people are turned away because of the the uh, the weight stigma 
uh, the, the weight bias that the doctor holds, that their belief that they are inherently more risky uh, because they don't want to have their insurance premiums increase. Their boss is telling them, don't do it because uh, we might have to pay more money. 17, drug trials are being performed on straight-sized people only. Luckily, a lot of drug trials with things like the COVID vaccine were, um, uh, were done with mostly fat people, actually. And that is because 70% of, of the population is fat. So, I mean, you can't get a, you know, in most of it's done on fat people, basically the population, which is great. But drug trials are often done on straight-sized people who they deem as healthy. 18, waiting room chairs with arms so fat people cannot sit, which means making visits to the doctor uh, impossible for some fat and disabled patients. 19, fat people are less likely to have cancer detected early and get effective treatment for it. Uh, so chemo drugs are often dosed for smaller bodies and the same dose given to fat people. Fat, breast, and ovarian cancer patients have worse outcomes, but when given the correct dosage, their risk was the same as straight-sized people. So, oh, turns out if you give them the right medicine dose, they're actually okay. Like, the risk is the same. But it's too hard to measure a medicine dosage. Just give them the same thing that, that um, straight-sized people get. 20, the experience of visiting a healthcare provider being so traumatizing that fat people suffer in silence and are delayed or denied important healthcare. I mean, every fat person listen to this, I'd say, you know, pretty much every fat person says, would say that they have um, fear going to a doctor. They've had a bad experience. It'd be a very, very lucky fat person who has not had a bad experience going to the doctor and being told, Oh, look at you, fatty, lose weight. I mean, mm. 21, gowns and wheelchairs don't fit. I mean, how often have you gone to get, you know, some type of an exam and they give you in a gown and it's like, uh, <laughs> this covers half my body. Um, you know, basic things don't fit. 22, being forced to crash diet to lose weight temporarily to get treatment. So some people... They don't have a choice. They need to get the treatment that they're being denied. And so they are forced. They don't have the, just, they don't have the free will. They are forced to temporarily lose weight, to go on a diet which is bad for their physical and mental well-being, to temporarily lose that weight, get the treatment, and then the weight comes back on because that's what happens. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. 23. You're less likely to receive an organ transplant as you're seen as high risk and left to die. There are not enough organs in the world. The doctors choose who is the best candidate. If you are fat, they, you're instantly labeled higher risk. 24, 50% of primary care physicians viewed fat patients as awkward, unattractive and non-compliant. One third said that they are weak-willed, weak -willed, sloppy, and lazy. 25, doctors reluctant to do pap smears if the patient is fat. Um, so pap smear, we call it in England smear, um, but uh, doctors are reluctant to do it, um, studies show if the patient is fat. 26, being denied surgery due to weight at very low cutoff points, including life-saving surgery like gender confirmation surgery. I mean, can you imagine? 27, yet stomach amputation or squeezing surgery surgically is magically safe. And then 28, being coerced and forced to have your stomach surgically, surgically amputated or restricted in order to get treatment for an unrelated condition. 29, only to be blamed when the surgery doesn't result in long-term weight gain. Uh, there was an episode that I did on um, weight loss surgery, in quotation marks, 
because it doesn't uh, often result in weight loss, um, showing that it's very similar to, to diets is that there isn't a lot of uh, long-term follow-up with, with patients. They lose weight and at about the 18-month mark, which is also the same for diets, about the 18-month mark is when they start putting the weight back on. Um, and yeah, surprise, surprise, there's no follow-up with people uh, long-term to see if they are fat or not. Um, and finally, 30, missed diagnosis or late diagnosis resulting in death. So, are you more on board with me saying that the way that public health is structured is modern day eugenics? And as a society, we're aiming to eradicate fat people and stop us from reproducing. We're aiming to, to kill fat people. Fat people are seen, seen as higher risk, less deserving, non-compliant, um, denied life-saving surgeries, but then given organ transplants instead, organ, organ um, amputations. I mean, yeah. So if you weren't aware of kind of, uh, I mean, these are just 30 things off the top of my head, right? Um, the list is, is endless. I mean, I can, <laughs> you can imagine the amount of, of, of issues that you just think, how is this a thing? How are they saying because, because they want fat people to go away, to die, to not exist, to stop being fat, they will, um, it's like they think they are dangling a carrot of, well, if you lose weight, then we'll, then we'll help you out. And one, that's fucked because people should be able to access healthcare exactly whatever weight they are. And two, there is not one single study ever to show any method, any diet is going to result in weight loss for any more than a tiny percentage of people and so they're dangling a carrot and that carrot is just fucking a piece of a piece of shit um unethical not science-based not evidence-based i mean it's just horrific so if you are a straight size person person and wonder, you know, like, why don't people just go to the fat people, go to the doctor and la la la, you know, yeah, they get told to lose weight and yeah, why don't they just lose weight? And we well, you know it, it's it's everywhere. It's everywhere you turn. It's 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 just an an environment of knowing that people who see you in a health as a healthcare provider are judging you and assuming that you are non-compliant, lazy, disgusting, um, unintelligent, won't do anything to help yourself. And I mean, that is not fun. And it kills people, kills fat people, kills fat people all the damn time. So anyway, um, that's the episode. Uh, I'm not going to say I hope you enjoyed it because I mean, it's just fucking just fucking depressing, isn't it? Oh my God. Um, maybe you enjoyed the story about my bad date. <laughs> maybe you enjoyed that. Uh, but thank you for hanging out with me today. I really appreciate it. And um, I will see you in the next episode of the Fierce Fatty Podcast. All right, see you later. Bye. Fierce Fatty Academy, which is my signature program where I teach all about how to overcome your fat phobic beliefs and learn to love your fat body. Then go to fiercefatty.com forward slash waitlist. Again, that is fiercefatty.com forward slash waitlist to get Get your name on the waitlist for when Fierce Fatty Academy, my signature program, opens. 